Welcome to the Israel Answers series, connecting Israel, the Bible, and you. Join Susan Michael as she explores timely issues and current events from a scriptural perspective to equip the Christian world with a balanced and biblical response. Be sure to subscribe for future episodes, which will ignite your faith and bring the Bible to life in your everyday world. Now, let's join Susan with your Israel Answers. Well, we are here at the convention of the National Religious Broadcasters with about 5,000 of wonderful friends and many supporters of Israel and many Israeli guests. And today we have with us a dear friend who is Ruth Guggenheim. She is the Interfaith Relations Director for Emuna, And we're looking forward to learning all about her work and the work of her organization. So welcome, Ruth. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Susan. I really appreciate your having me. And it's wonderful to be here at the NRB and sharing amongst all of us uh, what we all believe, our faith. Well, I understand that you were at our dinner in Washington, D.C. Tell me just a little bit about your impression there. <laughs> it was last year, last summer. Yes. So it, for, for us as Israelis, our, our world has certainly changed since then. But um, I was so impressed and moved to tears literally at the dinner and at the caucus before. Just as a Jew and as an Israeli, seeing the camaraderie, the friendship and partnerships and the fact that we have friends here standing behind us and helping to lobby for us. I just, it was so moving. Oh, well, I'm so glad you were there. I know I'd heard about you. I had been said I needed to meet you. And that was the first opportunity I had to meet you. So I'm so glad that you were there and able to experience that because sometimes you just need a little encouragement, right? <laughs> And uh, hanging out with us should should help with that, because we really have a world of Christians that love Israel, support Israel, and unfortunately, they're spread out all across the nation. It's kind of hard to, to get that feeling, but here this week, you will be really encouraged. So, yes. Ruth, you do live in Israel now. Yes, I live right? in Jerusalem. You were born and raised in the United States, I can tell from your <laughs> accent. But uh, you live in Israel now. So tell us about your background and tell us about your organization. Okay, well, thanks. So as you mentioned, I was born and raised in America. I was originally from the Washington, D.C. corridor. I, then I moved to Baltimore, raised my family there. I have three beautiful children. I have great grandchildren now. I made Aliyah. I immigrated to Israel seven years ago. It was a dream my whole life. And I knew that at a given moment, God would tell me when was the right time for me to, to go to Israel. And that happened a little over seven years ago. And wow. when I, yeah, so it's, Can um, you tell me about that. How did you know this is the moment? You know, when you always pray for guidance and you ask Hashem, you ask God to, to give you that kind of like sign for lack of a better word yeah. you 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 know it i can't explain it susan yes, but you can't it's many times it. in my life i have felt that like god's almost tapping me on the shoulder and saying this is the time yes and that, and i believe that for many it's like the the holy spirit Ruch Hakodesh, just moves in your heart and your mind now is the time because yes. he's drawing his children back home to the land oh, yes he's doing it and he does it in that way yeah. often. So. I mean, the ingathering of the Jewish people is so obvious. And since 1948, the unique thing that I find is um, it's changed. When when it was more of a political movement and a movement for survival, right. simple. our people needed to have, you know, God protecting us. But so it was the, you know, the Zionist movement was much more of a political entity. And now it's turning into much more of a spiritual entity. The The Jews of faith are coming back and saying, this is the time. Interesting. Well, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just wanted to uh, to hear your story. So please continue. So when I got there, you know, it's uh, interesting, Susan, I like many immigrants, we find out we thought we had jobs. <laughs> you get off the plane and you call that company that you thought you had an agreement with and they say, well, oh, you can continue, but it's going to be half the salary for twice the work. And it's like, I'm not sure that's what I signed on to. So what happened for me personally, and this was another kind of message from God. So it didn't work out what I thought I was getting there for the, the position. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do, to be perfectly honest. I was not in a position to live independently with no salary or income. And um, 
for three months, I wasn't sure. And I was off, I was offered a few things that just didn't feel right. And then someone introduced me to Emuna. Emuna is means faith. That's what the actual organization's name means. And I was interviewed and um I was offered a position there initially as a grant writer and a strategist, which is what I do basically, which I did in the States. And it was like a whole world opened up. I knew that I was meant to be at Amuna. The organization itself is one of Israel's largest humanitarian aid social service organizations. Oh. And it was started over 85 years ago by a group of religious Jewish women, Anglo-Jewish is women, right? who started to... to realize what was going on in Europe and also in the Arab countries in terms of persecution of the Jews. But they started with some of the the kinder transports. I mean, yes, you're familiar with I them. Am. So in order to save some of the Jewish youth, they brought some of them to Israel, to, to pre-modern day Israel, and they started the shelters. They were one of the organizations that assured mm -hmm. that we would bring children to our homeland. We would provide shelter and God willing, they would see their parents again. Unfortunately, as we know, many of them never, ever saw their family members, their parents, let alone. So here was this group of emuna, these religious Jewish women saying, OK, we now have shelters for these kids. Now we've got to educate them and we have to provide for them sustenance and an opportunity to grow and become healthy and to integrate into a new society. And that was the beginning of the emuna organization. And then when the Arab countries where the Jews there, especially after 1948 and persecution started, of the Jewish people after the modern day of Israel, they started to bring children from the more Sephardi or Yemenite backgrounds, the, the more Arab yes. the Jewish communities. And they literally started to raise hundreds of thousands of young Jewish children. And then we started schools. And from schools, we have moved on to start. It was one of the first organizations to realize the need for not just spiritual healing, but emotional and mental health. And they brought in crisis counseling centers and emergency centers to start dealing with the population. And we're talking, you know, decades ago, but it was very um, forthright. It was saying like, you know, we have to heal as a nation. There's so much trauma. And this was from that time for the the 50s and the 60s. So Amuna continued to grow. We have the largest network of subsidized daycare centers around the country with the idea that if you're a parent, a mom, a single mom, especially, and you need to either go back to school or to work to support your family, you need to be insured that your children are getting quality daycare. So on a day-to-day -day basis, Susan, Amuna serves 10,000 children and families daily through all of our 160 projects in the country. What a beautiful work. And uh, I love the names, Faith, <laughs> Emuna, and the the beginnings of it. What an amazing story. Uh, so what is your your specific role today in the organization? So it evolved literally four years, uh, almost five years ago. It was pre-COVID. Uh, it was right before COVID hit. And um, Emuna kept getting, con was being contacted by various Christian groups from the States and from Brazil and from France, you know, from abroad. And they were saying, we would love to learn more about Amuna. We heard about you from someone else. Yes. And can we visit some of your homes? Can we support? Can we serve? And the Amuna board originally was like, they didn't know what to do. I'm being perfectly honest. As you know, Susan, there is, there is a fear factor sometimes because when we have opened our hearts and homes, so we say to certain groups, they come in and they want to witness to us. And so we didn't, you know, they really didn't know what to do. So there needed to be a vetting process. And I have been blessed my whole life, my whole professional life, working for the Jewish community in interfaith relations. So I'm very, very comfortable with people of other faith, especially uh, even evangelical Christians. And when the board asked me, they said, you have this experience. What should we do? I said, first of all, let's create some guidelines and let's look together and sit with our Christian friends that want to support Israel and see if there's a, an opportunity to work together in partnership and friendship and healing. And when all that started to happen and, and we started to have dialogue, many of the the old guard, the board, who was concerned, they said, like, wow, you know, we just didn't know this. And this is clearly a different Christian community yes. than, than what we've experienced for the past 2,000 years. And many wanted to move forward with the opportunity that we felt that God is saying, this is the time to heal. You don't have to be the same. You can, God put us all here on a parallel path and we're to work together towards the benefit of the people.
Yes, well, you're absolutely right. We, uh, I, I've been involved a lot in Jewish Christian relations and building that relationship. And it, I tell everybody, you can't read a book on interfaith relations and go out and do it. You learn how to relate interfaith wise by doing it. And sometimes you learn the most from your mistakes. And so I always advise, you know, a Jewish organization wants to begin working with the Christian community. I'm like, yes, do it. But realize there may be some educational moments along the way where you need to kind of say, you know what, that actually is an offensive statement. And that, and you'll find a very open heart and then they have no idea because right. there's so much history between Jews and Christians, and the Jewish people know that history. And many of us Christians, we don't know that history. So we don't even know the sensitive topics. We don't know the red flags that come up in your mind because you know history that we don't know. And so I always make a point when I'm speaking in churches, We do I do seminars, is to educate on the history so that they understand this is a delicate relationship mm -hmm. and you can't just go in with your agenda. You've got to realize it's a relationship, it's a friendship. And the only time it's a genuine relationship is when it's sincere. You know, a sincere friendship means means there's no agenda. It's right. just a friendship, right? Right. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. Is it really love. unconditional or not? And yes. um, you're right. And one of the things, like you speak to your Christian brethren, we have to speak to the Jewish community too and explain there's not always the same agenda. This is a different group. And, and also, as you are aware, the Jewish community has a lot of different rules and regulations, if you will, based on our Bible scriptures. Right. And um, a lot of times our Christian friends don't understand certain aspects like for you know maybe you're in jerusalem and you don't understand that not all the men will will shake hands or right. hug or this or that so it, it's even just raising awareness on the most simplest level and that just starts the dialogue and once you sit down and you have dialogue you realize we have so much more in common yes and we are all god's children and we are doing his will yes yes well, tell me, uh, what is your greatest need today at MNL? What's a new project you're doing or your the greatest need? Um, I'm assuming you may have children that you're dealing with with trauma after October the 7th. So, Susan, the world literally changed on October 7th, and you know, especially at Amuna, because we have five residential homes that are specifically children that have, have been already abused, abandoned, and orphaned. Uh -huh. So these are children that have been have a history of trauma right. and neglect and, and pain. So, you know, that's one thing, but we also have a whole program with the Holocaust survivors who are the senior citizens. We have, I would say our biggest need right now is to help the people who heal to move forward and it's not going to happen till the war is over we with our over 100 crisis counseling centers and our highly trained therapists the need is is mounting day to day i just got a report just yesterday i mean like we can't even begin to phantom the the pain and the grief that the people of israel are feeling and there's a certain anxiety and anxiousness that we've never experienced before so on one hand Susan, the country is very united on, on with strength and dignity and pride but on the other hand the, the individuals that have been suffering their whole life for, from other traumas this has opened up a pandora's box that we really need to fill the gap. So as one of Israel's largest crisis counseling units, wow. not only were we on the front line when the war began, we're going to be we're going to be the last line of defense because when the war is over, the emotional needs of the people and the children is what we're going to be addressing. So you are right on target with the needs of the nation at the moment and I, I don't know. Do you know a statistic? Like, I think I heard this morning one third of the nation is actually traumatized at this point, or is it higher Susan, than I would that? tell you it's it's the entire 100%. nation. percent. We say in our therapists, in, it, it's everybody has been, because this is a different war. It's going on much longer than any other experience they've had. And look, I have a girlfriend that talks. She has seven grandchildren on the front lines right oh, now. I can't None imagine. of us are touched, aren't touched. We all know someone, if not our own family, that is on the front line. We have staff. Imuna alone has 3,000 employees because of our 160 
different projects. And of those 3,000 employees, hundreds have been called up to service. We've already lost some of our top directors to to the army that affects the chill if you're a director oh, or a, an assistant director at one of these residential homes at one of our schools and you've been killed think about that you're, you're not just leaving behind your family you're leaving behind your amuna whole family all those children and yeah. everything so i would say the whole country is traumatized and, and everyone's going to need some kind of support at the end yeah. of the day and you're, but you, you know if i can i'll tell you one last thing the um the, 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 there have been over a quarter of a million families, as you know, that had to move from the southern and the northern borders, in, and they have come into the center. When the war broke out, they had to come into the hotels. These are families that are living in single-room hotel rooms with two, three, four children. Now, this isn't vacation. It's not like you're no. going to Florida and you're going to Disney World and you're staying in a room for a couple of nights. This is three to four months, some of these families that have had to, you know, literally just leave their homes, leave behind. Some of them are now going back home, but they're the ones suffering. They're going back to homes that have been destroyed. And that they're now just going to start seeking therapy and help. Well, may the Lord uh, provide many resources for your organization so that you can meet the needs of your people um, because it is a nation that has been traumatized. And uh, but you're equipped, you're, I should say, maybe not equipped, but experienced. And um, so we'll see how that uh, the ICJ might be able to partner with you uh, to help. That would be a true blessing. So yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ruth, for coming and being and with us. And next time you're in the land, yes, come to one of our I, Luna facilities. Oh, we would, would love, love to host you. I would love to. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Out of Zion with Susan Michael. Be sure to subscribe to Out of Zion now on Apple Podcasts, cpnshows.com, YouTube, or wherever you like to listen and learn. Out of Zion with Susan Michael is a production of ICEJ USA, all rights reserved.